Dynasty, Dynasty, TV soap or real life drama. The famous families that make a habit of keeping it in the family. We examine today the dangers of decades of privilege for them and for us. This is Roundtable. I'm David Foster. So how do certain families rise to the very top and stay there? Was it money, good genes, good brains that allowed George W. Bush Sr. and Jr. to become U.S. presidents? The Rockefellers, Kennedys, Gandhis, well, they represent generations of success. The question is, when does the power of family dynasties start to affect democracy? <laughs> When you think of American politics, you think of the Kennedys, the Clintons, and the Bushes. In business, the Waltons, the Rockefellers, and even the Kardashians. They are all names synonymous with generations of success. But in a modern world of free markets and fair elections, why are dynasties still rising to the top? Is there power in keeping it in the family? America's former First Lady Barbara Bush died last month at the age of 92. She saw her husband, George H.W. Bush, become president in 1989, and then her son, George W. Bush, in 2001. Her other son, Jeb Bush, campaigned to be the Republican candidate for the 2016 presidential election, but lost to Donald Trump. Many credit Barbara as the force behind the Bush dynasty, but how did the family come to dominate American politics in the first place? How does someone become not only the wife of a US president, but the mother of one too? Is the system skewed to favor certain families in the political elite? Dynasties are usually born out of money, mainly business ventures and investments. In the US, it's known as the American dream, where everyone, supposedly, has a chance at making it big. But when does the power of dynasty start to stifle opportunities for others? More than 90% of America's businesses are family managed or controlled. Even the race for the last presidential election was limited to candidates with family connections and those able to bankroll expensive campaigns. Does it leave room for anyone else? And how does it affect democracy? Dynasties aren't limited to America. The history of China is divided into the rise and fall of ruling families. In Kenya, politics is dominated by the Kenyatta family. But across the Atlantic, in a land that fought to rid itself of the British crown and rebel against inherited status, has the US inadvertently funneled all of its power into a privileged few and created its own royal families? So what does it take to build a dynasty? And more importantly, to maintain it? Are those born into one given a golden ticket to life? And what danger do they pose to the rest of society? Our very own powerful family of guests here at the round table. We have Birmingham, uh, in Birmingham, Scott Lucas, Professor of International Politics at the University of Birmingham. We go to Gawagorm in Northern Ireland where we found Basundra Senate from the Travers Department of Political Science at the University of California, Berkeley. At the round table, Kurt Barling, Professor of Journalism at Middlesex University and former special correspondent for the BBC. And we have the historian and author, Justin Wintle. His work includes a history of China and its dynasties. Welcome to the program, all of you. Let's kick off with you, Kurt. Are, are all dynasties inherently undemocratic? Well, let's look at first principles. What are dynasties really about? It's about elites replicating themselves, and elites have replicated themselves since the beginning of time, because that's the way we organise ourselves socially. The people who are strong lead from the front. The people who lead from the front want to maintain their power and authority. That power and authority, the best way traditionally to maintain that was through kith and kin. It was called royalty, monarchy, for many, many centuries. Of course, then the French Revolution came along and said, 
We've had no truck with that anymore. Yeah. We want to have a different way of organising ourselves. We want different people to lead. We don't want the divine rights of kings to be the ones that choose our life, uh, our lifestyles and our life patterns. So is there any way, any way to stop a family dynasty once it's started, other than by violent means that we've just been hearing there? Well, I think that um, dynasties naturally rise and fall according to the um, inherent strengths and weaknesses of their members. I, I take slight issue with the idea of dynasties being applied so broadly and liberally. For me as a historian, a dynasty is a ruling family. Uh, and if you take America, where the use of the word dynasty, as in the TV show, uh, it's quite common and it's kind of nachleben for something which didn't happen in America, which was a, a, a dynastic ru uh, ruling family. Um, I had a published one that's called John Marcusy III, which suggests to me there's a John Marcusy II and the John Marcusy III. But he, he was a publisher. Now, one of the things about America, it's the land of opportunity, the American dream, where people go there so that they can build up their families, but they ain't dynasties as far as I'm concerned. But do we have, uh, Scott, come to you, since you're specialising in the American side of things, do we have dynasties in the Kennedys, uh, perhaps the Clintons, maybe the Bushes, and, and other examples that you might care to throw in, or, or, or not? Are they just elite families? I think it's a headline distraction to focus on dynasties, as the American call it. As Justin pointed out, in part, it's because of a cultural thing where we didn't have a king, didn't have a monarch. And the idea of families being so powerful, relatively recent in U.S. politics. The reason why I say it's sort of more of a myth is, look, there is the opportunity for mobility. Uh, consider Kennedy, for example, John Kennedy. He was an outsider, the first U.S. Catholic president. Consider Bill Clinton. I mean, he was a poor boy from Arkansas. So even though they might have had relatives who then went on to establish political careers, that in part is due to networks. So what I'd say is, look, money matters in America. Networks matter in America. But you could still have someone like a Barack Obama who came effectively from a broken home, single parent home, father who was born in Kenya, born in Hawaii. But through a lot of hard effort, he does rise through the ranks and become U.S. president. But, but does that mean that any? But yeah. for every dynasty, if you want to call them that, that you have, do you have to have a strong figure, a matriarch, a patriarch, a, a Joe Kennedy, a Barbara Bush? Oh, I, I think what happens is, is that we get the people who are in politics and then we create that impression of the figure to tell ourselves stories. I mean, for example, the idea of a Joe Kennedy, you know, who fought tooth and nail to get his family into politics. You've got to remember that Jack Kennedy succeeded. Bobby Kennedy, of course, then was killed, assassinated. Ted Kennedy never made it to the presidency. So in many ways, the story is as much one of failure as it is of ultimate fulfillment. And Barbara Bush, for all we could talk about the wife of one president, the mother of another, she's also the mother of a candidate who crashed and burned in 2016, Florida Governor Jeb Bush, because then it was an outsider, someone who wasn't even a Republican named Donald Trump who took the nomination. Faz, do you want to take us to India and um, Indian politics and um, dynasties there? Um, and we'll come back and talk about China in just a moment, if we may, with um, Justin here. Um, Ruling families, ruling elites. I mean, the n same names crop up all the time in India. That's right. That's quite right, actually. Uh, what we see in India is that, you know, we've had dynasties peppering Indian democracy since the rise of the first dynasty, which was the Nehru Gandhi dynasty, which is still powerful in India today and runs a party called the Indian National Congress. But apart from that, what we've been also noticing over the last uh, 60 to 70 years is that a lot of regional parties in India are now dynastic. Their succession within the party is through the bloodline. So you have a situation where, quite like in a monarchy, leaders that run political parties are anointing people from their families that will take over that political party. Uh, along with this, what researchers, uh, some of my friends actually who work on this, have also noticed is that Every time you have a, a dynastic party in politics, in, in uh, elected office, at any level of government, there's actually a representation deficit. So people are more likely to believe that their interests are not represented properly. So uh, if you really think about it, there's really one way to look at it, which is that you know, it, is, it is affecting this democratic notion of equality and merit in a very substantial way in South Asia. Do, do jump in any of you at any particular time, but my next question is, um, why do we allow this to happen? Is it because we don't recognise that it could become 
a powerful dynasty when it first starts, or because we're quite happy to allow but people... There is to an argument, isn't there? Is, why shouldn't we allow it to happen? I mean, families, uh, it is a fact of life that some people are more able than others, cleverer, etc. Uh, one can look at so many different countries and so many different variations. Going back to your original question about is it a threat to democracy, one of the things that interests me at the moment is, is the rise of, uh, of presidential dynasties, the Assads in Syria, the Kims in North, North Korea, uh, within a kind of phony democratic setting. They've got, I mean, North Korea uh, is the Democratic Republic, of uh, uh, People's Republic. China's the same to a certain extent, that they have constitutions which are as democratic as the American constitution. It's just that nobody ever pays any attention. Well, I think that them. goes to the heart of it, doesn't yeah, it? No, it's that's this, right. It's the countervailing power yeah. of the institutions in that's society right. which can prevent families taking control, wresting control from the voters from the well, this, this is this is it. This is where I was going. Is I mean, does it undermine our trust in democratic principles? In other words, why should we bother well, voting? Obviously, in North Korea and perhaps in Syria, there, there is no point. But it, but in true democracies, do you think? Well, what's what's the point? They're just going to carry on running. Well, our colleague from uh, Berkeley is just saying that actually in India, what you find is that there's a democratic deficit. People know there's a democratic deficit. Yeah. You can't hide that from people, and they uh, push back against it. And if the institutional framework is strong enough, and in India I suspect it is, in America it certainly is, in most European countries it certainly is, then there's a pushback against that dynastic instinct, that, that instinct for continuity and sameness that drives human societies, has always driven human societies. If you go to places like uh, many of the countries in Africa where there is a weak institutional base, it's much easier to capture the state, much easier to capture <coughs> power, and then dynasties can flourish. The Kabilas, for example, in the Congo. It's much more difficult for people to rid yeah. themselves of these, di you know, these dynastic uh, people if the institutions are weak. So let, let's go to the United States and, and talk about the, the dynasties that we have already mentioned. Is there a sense that as the generation succeeds, and one generation succeeds another and, and then another and so on, that the dynasty becomes weaker because people think, well, there's absolutely no point a um, either in trusting it or in putting our, our confidence in it uh, whatsoever, and that you're always going to see a decline in power and influence of these things and that they will eventually die out. Scott? I think it's, I think it's more that the myth of dynasty gets punctured mm -hmm. by politics, as it were. I mean, let's consider the three that we've talked about. Uh, the Kennedy dynasty, as it were, of course, there was tragedy that intervened. But the fact of the matter is, is that Democratic Party politics really paid uh, basically prevented Ted Kennedy from ever running for the White House. If you talk about the uh, talk about the Bushes, the fact of the matter is, is that Iraq 2003 is going to be the stain on that family's record, uh, no matter how much you try to get away from it, which meant that I think George W. Bush will be the last Bush who will be an American president. In the case of the Clintons, Bill Clinton succeeds, but Hillary Clinton, for whatever her strengths or weaknesses were, did not get that ultimate prize. And there, I think I want to add something to what our colleagues have been talking about, which makes America a bit different, or I want to put this to them. And that is, America is not, of course, just the federal government system in Washington. It's state and local governments with multiple parties that are represented there. Now, that doesn't mean that money and networks don't make a difference, say, in Alabama or in Iowa or in Idaho. But you have much more diversity in the type of people who have the aspiration to get involved, to get into the mix. And my Actually, I think the big shift in American politics beyond dynasty is what we've seen in the last two years. Whether you talk about the Women's March, whether you talk about the Me Too movement, whether you talk about the March for Life after the Parkland shootings this year, which is there, we're going to see the return of grassroots politics in the states in a big way. And that just focusing on Washington and dynasties sort of will distract us from that key shift in American society. And of course, you need those institutions to support that grassroots movement in order for it to flourish. Now, are there are other societies around the world where we could see those grassroots movements, but they are snuffed out by power, because, precisely because power fears it. America is not one of those places, fortunately, where that's happening, but there are many other societies where that is happening. Let's talk about some specific examples, and something, Fasu, that, that, that you wrote, um, is that most women candidates in India are elected to positions of power because of dynastic politics, not yes. in spite of. So there's a gender reversal here. 
Absolutely. On the one hand, you can list all the cons of having dynasts in elected office and, and dynastic parties in a country. And you can say that there's a representation deficit, but it's also had this curiously inclusive effect of actually allowing female candidates to contest and win when they contest and win in elected office. And the reason for that is that female candidates are not taken very seriously by political parties in India or by people that vote because they're just not seen as strong uh, electoral candidates. And consequently, what happens is that they're also underrepresented within political parties. Now, if they're the wife of a man who is electorally successful, the daughter of someone who is similarly successful, or an aunt or a niece, or in some way connected to a politically powerful man, this actually affects their political capital when they go and stand for election. So what's happened is that because of dynastic politics, we've seen this kind of strange role reversal where the same party structure that on the one hand doesn't take female candidates seriously is actually giving tickets to some women because they are part of what we call a Bahu Beti brigade. That's the daughter-in-law, daughter brigade. And, and that's how we're seeing at least some positive representation of women. Uh, jumping, because I know you want to that, respond to that. Then, then I want to ask more to do with patriarchy. I think it's more to do with patriarchy than dynasty. But if you come back to this point about uh, dynasty, let's take a country like Nigeria being specific. If you look at Abacha, the last dictator in Nigeria, what did he do? Like many other dictators in Africa, amassed a small fortune, which was stashed away in uh, Swiss banks. And his family were encouraged to get involved, to build up that power base. However, they fell flat, didn't they? Because the democratic instinct, even in a country like mm. Nigeria, meant that that dynasty could not so, survive. So the fill your boots philosophy, I know you want to say something else, Justin. So but, many but, things. But is there ever say. such a thing as a benevolent... Uh, dictatorship dynasty was there, there are certainly pretend I mean you take the can it ever be like Chinese that? system there were periods where um, the ruling emperors and the dynasties for all relatively short periods of time uh, according to the Confucian code which underwrote their power uh, actually behave pretty decently in historical terms the interesting thing about about Mrs. Gandhi there's also Aung San Suu Kyi whose father wa was You've the founder of Burma I wrote her biography yeah. uh, and and Benazir Bhutto and there's a very interesting thing uh, which is sort of dynast uh, dynastic uh, um, about daughters who um, follow in the father's footsteps but I was going to say something very very different which is the principle of dynasticism is the hereditary principle yeah. if you remove that the dynasties are still with us. Political parties in established democracies behave very much like, like dynasties without the hereditary involved. And what you get in America or, or Britain without Tory and Labour parties is you get these new style democratic dynasties which are elective uh, and which you have to compete inside to rise. And they behave. So for me as a historian, it's very easy to say dynast uh, dynasties versus democracy, but there's a continuity, and that's to, to do with a need for, for policies, a need for stability, a need for economic well-being. Lead for elites to perpetuate themselves. And you, Can yeah. I throw this out there? Can I throw right. this out there? We're talking specifically now about Indonesia, a piece I read in the New Yorker by Elizabeth Bissani, uh, discussing the fact that earlier this year, Indonesia's national parliament passed a law that tried to curb dynastic succession in politics. And there's a corollary to this, which she mentions later on, which I'll, I'll come to. But it begs the bigger question, is it ever possible to try to outlaw such things? Scott? Well, that varies from country to country. Uh, and what you actually have seen, of course, in the past is the way to outlaw a dynasty was through a revolution, for example, when we talk about monarchies. Now, uh, following up from what Justin's just said, what I think is more than trying to outlaw a dynasty or dynasty, Countries go through changes and transitions, sometimes violent, sometimes not violent. And I would take it to this extent, and that is that although we may look at a family, whether it's in a, revel, you know, a civil war society like Syria, or whether we talk like a large country like India, and the fact is there's always a shift which is going on. Let me bring it back to America. I think the two-party system, the Democratic and Republican Party system, in contrast to what Justin says, is, is not necessarily continuing the dynasties now. I think it's rocking. I think it's shaking. What you've seen with Donald Trump and as well as the Tea Party is that the Republican Party is a bastion for that type of elite 
is being challenged, not necessarily in a positive way, but it's being challenged. And the same thing is happening within the Democratic Party with various movements, environmental movements, the so-called alt-left movement, the progressive movement really asking, is this the way that we want things to continue to be done? The hope is, of course, that in these challenges to dynasties, it's not just a question of should they stand or should they fall, but that you find a progressive way forward that deals with what we've talked about with that so-called democratic deficit. But things don't change. Basu, let me come to this to you on this one. Indonesia, we're still talking. She goes on, this is Elizabeth Pisani to, to write, the archipelago is looking a lot like it did before the Europeans arrived five centuries ago. Uh, plus a change, etc., etc. Sorry, I didn't... I Nothing didn't changes. Ah, I it see. all stays the same. <laughs> Well, uh, actually, I, I want to touch on something that you'd asked earlier, which is, you know, this idea of, demo, of dynastic per, uh, persistence in politics. And I think there's this idea that, that dynastic politics somehow signals uh, an ancient regime of sorts, which is just kind of coming into this modern world and capturing democracy and, and tainting it with, with inequality and all of these things. And some of that is true, obviously. But there's another part that we really need to look at, and that part... Uh, focuses on the idea that, you know, who is a dynast A? How, does that, how do these dynasts succeed? And for that, what they need is a political party. They succeed through something that is essentially a vehicle of modern representative democracy. So really, when we're talking in terms of persistence of such rule and outlawing it, you know, in India, uh, in the Indian context, there is actually no law that says that a dynast cannot take over a political party. There's no law uh, in the Indian Representation of People's Act that actually says that, you know, mm. someone whose father has been in elected office cannot compete. And sure, we're seeing the rise of a very upper caste, birth-based ruling class in India, and that has persisted for a very long time. At the same time, there's really no effective way to tell people that, hey, you can't compete because someone in your family was already in politics when... These guys are actually running organizations that are the vehicles of modern representative Gosh, democracy. We, we, we could go on forever on, on this one, but I have to bring it sort of back, back to a particular point, which is that do all dynasties end badly? The, the, the point has been made um, that Papa Doc's son could not continue with his father's inheritance, Jar of Iran, etc., etc. We see Daniel all, Ortega... All well, they, they all end badly for the, for the simple reason that none have gone on forever. <laughs> And all, is it as simple as that? They're all fragile societies. So then nobody's ever going to say, look, I'd like to retire from this dinner. <clears throat> They've all ended bad. Oh, just, just, just occasionally you get uh, one or two of the Chinese... Well, I mean, um, let's be honest. We're Trump. sitting here in London talking about dynasties, and there's one dynasty that was called to account. It was called to account by Parliament. Uh, our dynasty went on for well over 1,500 years until Parliament said... No, we don't want to regulate our affairs like that anymore. So the reason it's called the mother of all parliaments is precisely because it held to account dynastic power and the monarchy found itself reduced. Yes, it's, it's, a, it's such a difference between a constitutional monarchy mm. um, and, and a kind of... Uh, that's uh, what people. evolved. All, exactly. all dynasties mm. start in different ways with a founding figure who's, who, 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 uh, who knows about power, who's very bright, etc., etc. And that's how all the Chinese... Dynasty. They were all founded by strongmen, with the exception of the Qing, who, who put a child on the throne. Mm. And, but you get that in, in business as well. You get the strongman who says, what my, my point about parties, and I think Scott and I probably agree, particularly in the one-party state, and I think what the Chinese have thought, uh, apart from the hereditary principle, Mao was the founding strongman. Mm. It is so like uh, a new imperial age with the emperor, but the difference is the succession is not hereditary, uh, you, uh, you often get the number two comes along, Deng Xiaoping in, in China, who modifies the thing and retailers it to suit more common needs. Can I ask Scott, as, as we come towards the end of this, this programme, in fact we haven't got very much time at all, um, we've talked about the Kennedys, Clintons, the Bushes, is there anybody in another generation, in another family that we should be watching to see perhaps if they're going to be the start of a new dynasty? If you want to well, call it that. Well, within the Kennedy family, there's a, a, a new generation of Kennedys. Joe Kennedy gave the response to the State of the Union address this year. So those still family ties still start. Uh, but no, I think the what's happened with American politics, with the destabilizing effect of Donald Trump, which has been damaging in so many ways, is that it actually has thrown everything up in the air and others. And I think you're probably looking at 
politicians that we aren't even seeing in the headlines right now who are going to come forward in the next few years with alternative ways of trying to put all this back together. But let me just come back on Justin on one point. Is China the one dynasty that succeeded through the party? You know, we're less than 30 years removed from Tiananmen Square, so I don't even think that one is a, is a sure bet in the long it's run. It's very early days. What interests me is, is there a Trump dynasty in the making? Are his sons... In that Russia? will be the subject for another <laughs> programme, Justin. Thank you all very, very much indeed. I suppose to some extent it all comes down to the, the suggestion that children don't take after their parents, they take after their grandparents because they want to sort of skip a generation and the mistakes that their parents have made. So we will always see the ebb, ebb and the flow. But when it comes down to, to dynasties, whether they be political or, or, or other forms of dynasties, it's very much about perhaps wanting the very best for your children. You put them in positions where you think you're giving them the very best, uh, whether it's the best for them or for their people is, is another matter. Um, thank you. Thank you all very much indeed for taking part in this round table. Uh, from me, David Foster, from my guests, we hope to have your company next time. Bye-bye for now. <laughs>